Right, so what I'll do is just to give you a quick overview of the uh, OLT project we've been working on on business simulations because we've got a lot more time after uh, morning tea to, uh, to unpack all of this and um, some of you might be ready for a cup of coffee. So, uh, so we'll just whip through this fairly quickly. <clears throat> I, I just want to acknowledge that, the, that the, this particular project, like uh, Liz and, and Janice's project, uh, involves a whole suite of different people from from a range of institutions, uh, some of whom are here um, today, uh, hovering around the back uh, the back of the room. But it's it's been really exciting working with this project team uh, from La Trobe University, uh, Paul, who was at Victoria University previously, but now at um, at William Anglis, uh, bringing a new uh, a new perspective from the non-public university system. Uh, uh, We've got some team members from the University of South Australia and some team members from Griffith as well. So it's been really enjoyable to do this project on simulations uh, to look at how they work in these different uh, university settings. We started this project uh, with the notion that, that there were a number of challenges in business education. There are more now after the conversation we had this morning. But these are some of the things that concerned us about business education. One of them was uh, that business schools are often the largest or one of the largest schools in, uh, in, in most universities and pro programs particularly in business and commerce have large numbers of students and these large cohorts create some challenges for us in terms of how we uh, turn some of the theory into practice or allow students to practice and reflect on uh, on their own capabilities. Another issue, another challenge for us I think in business is that uh, we tend to use a, a lot of different types of assessments that are not always particularly effective at developing these business capabilities or managerial skills and uh, if I can count on several hands the number of, uh, of colleagues who set students reports or essays to write um, which are good for developing particular sets of skills but they are uh, also uh, quite limited in developing other types of business capabilities or skills, uh, and they're not very, um, very dynamic. Uh, it's not uncommon for a student to go through a business degree at some point to be asked to do uh, do a strategic plan or a business plan or a marketing plan, and that's also a useful learning exercise. Uh, the limitation with that is the student doesn't get to implement that plan to then see uh, how uh, how a, how a business would perform in response to that plan. Um, we've heard some. Uh, comments about case studies from the front here which uh, which is very helpful as well. Um, case studies have a couple of problems. One is that some of them date very quickly, some are not very very detailed and even the good ones, students respond to the case study perhaps with a plan or a set of recommendations and like the, the, the planning type documents, you then don't get any kind of feedback apart from the, from the feedback that you might get from your lecturer about how the business then goes on to perform uh, as a result of those recommendations. Uh, work in graded learning is becoming more common in business, certainly more so in some universities than others. Uh, in some places it, they, it is now a core expectation. And certainly that is good for conditioning students to the, uh, to the workplace and helping them understand the world of work and preparing them for that transition to work. And I'm a big fan of work in graded learning. But I think there are also some limitations, and, and we've heard some of those this morning, around the quality of some of the experiences that our students have. There's a lot of variability. Some of our students have fantastic experiences, and others have very ordinary experiences that don't really allow them to apply what they've learned at that advanced um, undergraduate or even master's level. We also um, have a lot of exams in business. They seem to be particularly common in economics and, uh, and accounting. Um, they are effective at testing knowledge uh, in, in a lot of cases, but not at developing skills. Uh, and MOOCs, uh, new, new kid on the block, I guess. I was at the ASCII Light conference um, in New Zealand last week where there was still quite a lot of conversation about MOOCs, but the conversation now has turned from one of optimism to a more critical perspective on what, what MOOCs can actually do for us. Um, there's some very interesting statistics about who actually does MOOCs and the features of people who complete them. Um, uh, and 
having done a couple myself as a student for Open Universities Australia, because I was curious about what they could do, um, I would, my, my assessment is that they are, they are good at developing knowledge, but like exams, not particularly good at developing skills. So, uh, so there are a number of limitations around some of the types of assessments and pedagogies that we might use. So our um, question is about how we can provide large cohorts of students with an experience uh, where they can sharpen their managerial skills through regular feedback. Uh, just a little bit of theory to set, set the context here. I'm a big fan of Jan Harrington's work. Jan Harrington's at Murdoch University. Uh, I would say that she's the world leader in authentic learning in digital environments. Um, she specialises in these technology digital environments and how they can provide authentic learning experiences. And uh, sh she's developed this really nice model. If you type in Harrington authentic learning and uh, you, uh, you'll, you'll come across her website. She's got a lovely website where she unpacks a lot of her ideas around authentic learning. She also has lots of books, but the website's pretty good. Um, she argues that uh, the authenticity experiences we can give students can be mapped on a matrix. Um, so in this matrix, we have an academic setting and a real setting, a decontextualized setting and an authentic setting. So she argues that we can have academic tasks in academic settings, and I guess those are the traditional types of assessments that we would run with students, uh, like exams, essays. Um, I would put MOOCs in that category. Uh, she then talks about uh, academic uh, tasks in real settings. Uh, so we might send students out to do a, an observational study, uh, or we might uh, take them on a field visit. Uh, we might get them to complete worksheets out, uh, uh, out outside of the university setting, but they are still academic tasks. Then we have at the bottom there authentic settings, real tasks in academic settings. Uh, and this is where I feel simulations, uh, things like problem-based learning and case studies and scenarios uh, fit in, and then real tasks and real settings all the work in grad learning and placement stuff, the service learning and so on. So that's useful just for positioning the work that we're doing in simulations where we think they fit in. Um, our view is that simulations are not the, the bee's knees and be all and end all of, uh, of business education, that they are part of a tapestry of different um, assessment, authentic assessment experiences that we should be providing to students. This is the learning pyramid. This is a, a bit of a pop ed um, theory. Uh, I, I've seen very little evidence of this, but it's a useful framework just for making the point that, uh, that the passive experiences we give students, like lectures, uh, watching videos, um, doing demonstrations, uh, result in less learning. And the more active experiences uh, where we ask students to discuss things, where we ask them to practice by doing something, uh, or uh, where we get them to teach others how to do something, are much more likely to result in, uh, in information retention. Simulations, uh, I think, fit into this kind of 75% band, get them to practice by doing something. Uh, so the work that we're doing uh, fits into this broader field of simulations. And to help visualize it, I've put together a, a bit of a hierarchy. Um, business simulations broadly can be broken down into physical simulations and virtual simulations. Some uh, business schools uh, run really effective real simulations in, in the classrooms through role plays, uh, uh, acting, uh, and scenarios that are given to students. We're not particularly interested in those for this project. We had to uh, set the scope at some level. We're interested in the virtual simulations, but when you unpack that, there are also quite a few different types of virtual simulations. Um, some of them are software based. Uh, then you have to mess around with the IT guys at your university to get them installed in a lab. Um, you have to then be able to get students into the lab in a way that fits into the timetable. Too hard, as far as I'm concerned, too difficult. Um, which is why we focused on online simulations. Now, most of these online simulations are browser based, so you're able to access them on a tablet a Mac, a PC, uh, you can access them anywhere you have an internet connection. So the constraints that you have around labs and uh, software installations 
uh, are much reduced. I'm not saying there are no technical problems, because there sometimes are technical problems, but, um, but that's much reduced. And then within that grouping, some of the simulations are 3D virtual learning environments, uh, similar to the, the kind of second life experience, and others are more data-centered. So students interact with the simulation through a series of menus, buttons, um, and their decisions are, are put in uh, uh, through a, a menu system, and the outcomes are presented as data, such as uh, balance sheets, profit and loss statements, uh, employee satisfaction scores, and so on. So we are interested uh, mostly in these data-centered uh, simulations. Uh, th there are many of them on the market. Uh, our project was not about creating a new simulation. It was about how we could use the many that are available in the marketplace uh, to help students learn. And we're interested in the pedagogy and the assessment that people then use around those simulations. And if you, if, for those of you that like definitions, typically these simulations are complex simulations designed to teach things like strategy, competitor analysis, finance, marketing, human resources, um, the cross-functional alignment between a lot of those areas, and the selection of, of tactics and strategies to build a successful business. So most of them require students to build a virtual business, whether it's a, uh, a bike shop, as, as uh, Mike's Bikes does, a, a cafe, an airline, a hotel, uh, a manufacturing business, which is what Capsim does. Uh, they all require students to, uh, to run a business, sometimes competitively with other students uh, in, in the class. So these are the, 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 the sorts of simulations that we've, we've been studying. A couple of uh, examples, that's a screenshot from Capsim Capstone, Mark Strat, which is obviously focused on marketing. Uh, this is one from HOTS, which is a hotel simulation. Um, this is one that Guy will demonstrate later this afternoon, which is an airline management uh, simulation, just to give you a bit of a flavour for, for some of the different products in the marketplace. I should say that as part of our project, we've, we're developing a listing of all of these simulations. It's one of the resources we would like to provide to people who are thinking of introducing simulations into their, um, into their programs, and that listing is on our website. So the aims of the project are pretty straightforward. We wanted to map what was out there. Uh, the biggest challenge when you set out, you make the decision, yes, I'm going to have a simulation in my course, is you start ser searching the web and um, there are very few resources to support you in your decision making. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons for this particular project, is to develop that resource base through our, our website to make it easier for people to select and implement a, uh, a simulation. So to do that, we wanted to do an audit and uh, we, we are aware of about 30 um, simulations, commercial packages uh, in the marketplace. Some universities like Wollongong have created their own because the commercial packages don't meet all of their needs. Um, so there are many out there and still the project's been running for a year. Still every other week I get an email from somebody saying, hey, we've, have you heard about this simulation? There's another, so there's another one to add to the list. Um, so we're in the process of doing a more detailed mapping of the more popular simulations at the moment to help people with their decision making. We also want to evaluate the contribution of simulation pedagogies to student learning outcomes and I'll talk about how we do that after, uh, after morning tea. But we want to understand what it is that students learn from, the, from simulations. Um, to identify and promote the, uh, the more innovative pedagogies and resources that people use and we uh, are doing that by developing case studies, quite detailed case studies that you can have a look at on our website and to uh, understand some of the challenges of using these online simulations in a higher education environment. So we've developed a range of resources and I'll drill down into some of these in a bit more detail after morning tea, but um, the simulations audit is really the, the A to Z listing of, uh, of the simulations that we are aware of. Uh, to try and understand what students are learning from simulations, we have developed an instrument called the, the Simulations Learning Barometer. Uh, and there is quite a, a theoretical, a heavy theoretical construct sitting behind that barometer. But it's essentially an instrument that students fill out at the start of the semester and at the end of the semester to try and measure um, their perceptions of whether they've de further developed skills in particular areas, knowledge in some of the major areas of business, 
Uh, there are questions around teamwork and collaboration, uh, self-efficacy, student motivation engagement. So there's a whole package of different questions, and I'll talk more about that after morning tea. Uh, towards the end of the project, which will be about the middle of next year, we, we will finish up the Good Practice Guide. The Good Practice Guide draws together many of the things I'm going to talk today uh, uh, with you about, and also uh, uh, pulls together a number of the threads across the different case studies that, uh, that we've been developing. Uh, so it's a resource that people can pick up and say, well, if you're implementing a simulation, here are some of the things you might want to think about. And here is where you go for resources. And here are some ideas for assessment. Here are some ideas of what you need to do for students in the classroom to support them through that, um, through that whole process. So that's the, the purpose of the Good Practice Guide. All of it is on the website, as it, as it is with Liz's project, the Capstone website. And it's uh, a resource that will be there long after the, the life of the project. And the workshops are what we're doing now. Um, so, um, the, um, the website is quite detailed. Uh, the case studies, as you can see, sometimes include resources like marking rubrics, which um, we're happy for people to download and adapt and modify for their own use. Um, there, there, are, there will be a video with each case study, so you can hear from the um, educator about how they're using uh, their simulation. Uh, there are also, in some cases, assessment guidelines, which would be the guidelines you would give to students, the instructions you give to students.